The opening sequence of episode 46 drops us right into the climax of the entire rod transformation. With that slow, pulsing beat and distorted music emphasizing the sheer horror of what's about to happen. <laughs> And of course, we also see the return of Armin's narration, which I think again is just a matter of this being a historical turning point with Historia retaking her throne. We also get our first proper look through a Titan point of view and how they perceive other people. Well, actually, okay, that is a lie, because while I say it's the first, it's not actually the first. This actually connects back to Aaron catching glimpses of what looks to be the basement key almost burning up. In reality, that is that glimmering light within Grisha moments before Aaron was going to eat him. That was actually Aaron's Titan point of view. We've talked plenty about the Titan mechanics before, so I won't rehash all that again. And the last thing we see before we move on to the title card is this zoom out shot of Rod. The CG is a little bit PS2 era, but I think it's just really cool to convey the sheer size of this Titan. The only thing I'd mention here is that they probably should have added like a building here and there, just so we get a clear contrast for his size. It's like an open field, and we don't really have a point of reference, everything is kind of big, so that size doesn't really hit the same. Still cool though. As for the title of the episode, Ruler of the Walls, it's just Historia's line from the episode, so not much else to add there. Though an alternate, and a bit more abstract interpretation I would offer up, is that the true ruler of the walls is fear, or on the opposite side, perception of trust and safety. Or, in other words, what makes Historia the true ruler of the walls is the people's trust in her, and that trust stems from her confronting their fear. Moving into the episode itself, we pick up where we left off with Erwin laying out the plan of kiting Rod all the way to Orwood. And this is where the many inversions and parallels to Shagan Shinob already begin, with the garrison captain calling out Erwin for using this entire district worth of people as just kind of bait. In Shigan Shinob, they were of course still living in that sweet, sweet ignorant bliss. So there, the Captain Hannes was just sort of vibing with no knowledge of this existential threat quickly closing in. Well, he was actually the unit captain, not the captain, but you get the idea. Point being that things have changed and we know a whole lot more about the world. And to immediately showcase that, Hanji explains that Rod is an abnormal and that his perception is all kinds of weird, which again ties back into everything we talked about last time. What we didn't talk about last time though, is the potential of Rod just bulldozing the wall. Because don't forget that Hanji is well aware of the Titans within the wall. And while that is never explicitly mentioned here, I think it's fair to say that that is another variable on everyone's mind. As of now, we of course have no idea how the wall Titans actually work. But we do know that pure Titans will start to move as soon as sunlight hits them. So if I had to make a guess, I think it's as simple as them not really wanting to test yes, any hypotheses that may or may not involve literally hundreds of thousands of colossal titans, you know? And Hanji also slips in how Aaron actually tried to control Rod, but that it just didn't work. It's just another bit of evidence that there must be some other prerequisite, that of course being a titan of royal blood. With a sample of just two events and sort of one attempt, it's definitely not a totally scientific conclusion, but considering what we learned in the Crystal Catacombs, I remember that this was a very good jumping off point for many of my tinfoil conspiracies. Though compared to most other arcs, everything following this point is actually very straightforward. Rod is kinda just a conduit to legitimize Astoria, and there are a whole bunch of parallels thrown in there to just contrast how the main characters have changed and how the battle has now shifted now that we know that the enemy is human. And speaking of, this shot of the sunrise is just absolutely gorgeous, and I think the juxtaposition it creates to the Colossal where it was this grimy sunset is also really, really cool. We might have this larger than the Colossal weirdo crawling toward the district, but things have changed. This is humanity's dawn, not twilight. More on that soon. Another sort of a callback, not really a callback, to earlier in the season is the garrison just telling everyone that all the cannons and everything are just exercises. So it's again all about telling a narrative. Though importantly, unlike with the coup, they very much lack the social capital to pull off any of this, with all the locals already saying that this is just some weird power move to show how much control they have. Some are even saying that life under the False King was actually better. You know, ignorant bliss and all that. But again, all of this is just setting up Astoria's ascension. Something that I find really cool here though, is the whole cannon barrage. Obviously by itself, it has like absolutely zero effect. Which then leads into the whole Aaron plus Scouts plan. But I think the interesting part here is how it demonstrates that technological adaptability of the walls. The cannons they have currently are a pretty solid solution for predictable pure titans. Not so much for weird abnormals and even more so for Big Lad Rod. And so we workshop this little explosive device just to get closer to his weak spots. 
But if we cut to Season 4 in Fort Slava, they basically have the same exact setup of parody, but one that is actually adapted to Marley's warfare. Much like we'd see very soon with the Thunder Spears, I really like that slight bit of realism when it comes to technological progress in times of war. Plenty more on this with Season 4. And the last thing we see before we hop on over to our main trio is Erwin going to talk to Astoria. Here we basically see the continuation of those narratives that they must now tell. With Astoria just saying that the people won't bow down to some random girl claiming to be queen, saying she needs to show them who she really is. From a direction standpoint, sure, their conversation was like 100% predictable. But I think the way they gradually revealed it throughout the episode was really, really neat. My favorite bit has to be the admittedly very cliche, no Astoria, I can't let you, but with the shape that my body is in, I can't stop you either, can I? It is super cheesy, but whenever I see this, well, you can't do that, but I can't stop you. I really, really like it. Oh, and we'll also talk about this plenty more with our glorious ballhead and return to Shiganshina, but I think it's also worth noting that this plan is really formalized by Astoria, not Erwin. We obviously know that Erwin is thinking like 50 steps ahead, but the problem with that is that he thinks very, very big picture. Astoria and later Armin, on the other hand, focus a bit more on the human variable. So, while the coup d'etat clearly worked and Astoria's coronation would have almost certainly worked as well, Astoria actually appearing in this mission just bolsters that organic respect and faith in their new queen. Like I said, I think this is best showcased with Return to Shiganshina, so keep that in mind for now. But still continuing on that Astoria thread, we then jump on over to Eren's inner monologue about how he always thought that Astoria was the weakest, but now he realizes that it was actually him. With him then saying that, at some point, he just accepted that he was in some way special, and that his titan was actually his own strength even though clearly it wasn't. And as he says this, we also visually see him untangling that web of rope which you could take to mean him trying to unravel his emotions or working through those mess of memories. As for the whole being special angle, this is something we'd return to in just a couple of episodes, but I think it plays into those two opposing perspectives on the world that we see in the series. One is a nihilistic thought that this cycle of hatred will never end, and that humans are no more than wild animals pursuing their primal desires. But the other is a more hopeful perspective where the mere act of being born is already special. It's that gift of life that is worth protecting. Aaron and Emir choose to destroy the world because violence is the only thing they ever knew. Emir was enslaved, beaten, and hunted. Mikasa was almost sold to who knows what. Titans destroyed Aaron's home and tore apart his family. His closest friends and even his own father and half-brother betrayed him. The world is a cruel place and so he puts an end to it. His story, on the other hand, despite her somewhat rough upbringing, begins to see the beauty in this ugly world. She remembers her time with Frida, she sees the citizens of the walls that need guidance, and she sees just how strong-willed her allies are. The world may be a cruel place, but there is hope, and that hope must be protected, conveyed very visually with the planting of the trees after the rumbling. More on the trees later, as that is also a recurring symbol. Though like we've talked about before, with Aaron and the Founding Titan, there is also that dimension of him actually being both sides of the arguments. With him then saying that, it's humanity that got the worst side of the deal, being stuck with pinning their hopes on him. The non-Founding Titan Aaron does represent humanity's drive for freedom, while the Founding Titan Aaron bears the hatred of every single past generation. But okay, we talked plenty about that with the Crystal Catacomb, so let's leave it at that. What is interesting though, is that he actually vocalizes some of this. If you ask me, this may or may not be another case of him subconsciously wandering through time, just like we see very, very soon with the Owl. He also notices this trio of kids, but Armin kind of steals my thunder and explains all the parallels, so you know what, Armin? Fine. I won't even talk about the marrying here to the Colossal and Shiganshina. Your fault, Armin. You want to explain it? Go ahead. I'm waiting. Ballhead. Though what is very eyebrow raise worthy is Aaron briefly getting a third person view of him and Mikasa trying to save their mom. Considering Aaron just vocalized his inner monologue and the whole untangling memories imagery, could this be another case of Amir watching them? Don't forget that as Hannes was getting them out of there, Mikasa got one of her headaches. And Dina is also wrapped up in all of the future Aaron shenanigans. So I wouldn't even be surprised if this is indeed meant to be a slight Amir cameo. Which nicely leads us into Aaron beating himself up. He says that he just wanted to knock some sense into this weakling. But maybe it's actually guilt because he did just see through Amir's eyes. Hmm, okay, that makes very little sense. Jumping on over to the mid card, we talked all about the bigger than the Colossal with the same steam ability last time. But what I didn't mention, and thank you to everyone who pointed that out, is that in the manga, the serum apparently says the strongest titan, likely pointing to the Colossal. 
I'm gonna be honest with you though, even knowing what to look for, I still have a very very hard time actually making it out, but I don't know, maybe I'm just dumb. But whatever the case, I guess I take that as a confirmation for all of my Colossal Titan ramblings last time, so that's pretty fun. Returning to the episode, we see all the cannons just blasting Rod. Problem is, basically nothing has any effect on him and he quickly reaches the wall, very much mirroring episode 1 and the Colossal. And that anxiety-inducing yet cold track kicking in is once again just perfect. But while I say much of this mirrors the Colossal, what is most certainly a new addition is Rod's guts just pouring over the wall. Number one, that is just super gnarly and super cool. But number two, it has created some confusion as we know the Titans shouldn't really have a digestion system. But at the same time, we have seen that Forbidden Jelly back in Trost. So my interpretation of this is very, very simple. I think they have the organs, but it's not actually digesting anything in the same way that like a zombie doesn't digest anything. I do think it's also worth noting that there might be an angle of the anime just taking some creative liberties just to make this whole thing a bit more gruesome. But at the same time, I really don't think this is like a huge plot hole or anything. Jelly Boys aside though, I love the sound design here, with that intense pulsing beat being abruptly cut short as Levi grabs the captain. Be devastated. The garrison has done its duty. Things may look dire, with everything playing out in a awfully similar manner to that of the fall of Shiganshina. But this time, things are actually different. It's no longer inexperienced garrison soldiers being caught off guard. We have the strongest and smartest people on the island all working together to stop a threat they had time to prepare for. And so, we see Eren transform, with the episode not even treating it as a big deal to again emphasize how much things have changed. Despite the circumstances, there is nothing hectic about this. There is no screaming about traitors, no last words, nothing. Aaron transforms and everyone is ready to execute the plan. And speaking of, this fisheye shot of Erwin goes unfathomably hard. Everything. And the shot of Aaron casually running over Erwin goes Everything. equally hard. Everything. And Rod's ground off face just turning to face Aaron is also absolutely the glorious. The one and only thing that does seem a little bit odd here is how little damage Rod does when he actually smashes down onto the wall. But then again, I guess even smashing Reiner up against the wall also didn't really do anything. Maybe it is as simple as blunt damage just not really being enough to break through. Annie was using hardened fingies, so she kinda dug through, you know? But whatever the case, throughout Eren's charge, we flash back to Erwin where we actually hear the plan. Instead of targeting the nape, they're going to punch through his throats and just blast the whole thing into oblivion. Returning to that adaptability angle, this is of course the same exact thing we later see with Reiner and even Eren to a certain extent. So again, I think it's just a neat way of showing us how that technological and strategic progress actually comes about. It's not just a big brain we're going to blast Reiner, no, we actually already did this because we were sort of forced to come up with a solution. And later on, we use that sort of non-directly applicable solution to this new problem. Though with him being blasted all over the place, the scouts all fly off, slicing and dicing at Rod's remains before he can regenerate. Which by the way, why didn't we ever see anything like this with the Titan Shifters? Imagine how cool it'd be if we like defeated someone, thought they were like 100% dead, but no, health bar 2 pops up and they transform all over again. I guess we do kinda see that with Reiner and sort of also Zeke, but that doesn't count, okay? The ODM gear animation is absolutely beautiful as usual, and the shadow clearing Astoria's face as she realizes what she must do is also just a stroke of genius. And speaking of, Astoria sort of breaking away from the Ghost of Rod is also absolutely excellent. Though the interesting part here is her suddenly getting Rod's memories. We of course know that Royal Blood is a conduit for the Founder's access to the paths and all the memories that come along with it. But there is also that time where Astoria gets Emir's memories from the letter, so it does seem like the royal blood itself has some sort of memory alteration properties. And by alteration, I mean just getting them. It's not like really altering the memories, but it's altering Astoria's memories because she gets Rod's memories, so it's not really altering Astoria's memories, it's just altering her total memories because there are now new memories. What am I even saying? Then again, neither these or Amir's memories actually have a super tangible impact on the story outside of showing things to us as the audience. So from that perspective, all of this could also just be a very practical thing of, well, just telling the story. Though after slicing a big lad rod and taking a tumble onto the main streets, much like we talked about last time, Istoria asks herself whether this is really her acting of her own free will. Keep that in mind for just a bit, but she then just stands up and announces that she is Astoria Rice, their rightful queen. And before we continue with Astoria's decision, we jump on over to Kenny, where we see a sort of a similar series of events. 
with him also reminiscing about Yuri, then a very, very rough looking kid Levi, and finally, his squad. I think basically everything we'd be seeing on Kenny's side of the story from this point is meant to very deliberately contrast and potentially even undermine Astoria's story. Which is also why I chose to tie them together here. And so, we see him sitting under the tree, all by himself, just bleeding out. And that is when Levi finds him for one last conversation. From a purely visual sense, the sunset clearly contrasts the dawn we just saw with the story side of the story. While the tree that he sits beneath shows us the old roots he still holds onto, those being the memories of Yuri. Though Kenny being Kenny, he still pulls a bitter reverse Uno, revealing that he stopped by the local gacha machines and actually pulled the ultimate gacha. That of course being another Titan injection. And on that note, let us jump right into episode 47, which immediately mirrors the construction of the gallows from a few episodes prior. Only this time, they're raising the royal thingies, I don't know what those are. Very, very big picture-wise, and coincidentally, this does work out to be almost the exact middle of the series, but I think these couple of episodes mark this sort of liminal period where all the main players move into their final roles, and those underlying themes of a human conflict really take front stage. A pseudo-colossal titan threat has now been defeated, marking the pinnacle of our titan mastery. We will now learn of the Ackerman lineage and Levi's past. With the events of the Crystal Catacombs and now Yuri, Eren's founding titan will slowly become more and more understood as well. Kenny and all the corruption from the walls is now also cleared. And most of all, Historia becomes queen. All the cascading stories from way way back in season 1 are now aligned. And so, we'll turn our sights to where it all began. Shiganshina. Oh, and we also see Levi scouting the pillars again that seem to go on for as long as we can see, but okay, no more wall titan conversations. As for the title of the episode, Friends, I think there are a few interpretations. The most obvious one is of course Kenny and Yuri. The entire episode revolves around that, so really not much else to say there. But equally so, I think you could also apply this to Levi. For him, there is Kenny, but that's sort of a paternal link. What I think is more important is Levi's squad. Hold that thought for now. Moving into the episode itself, we go way back in time to Kenny meeting Yuri for the first time. Right away, we see how back in his day, the mere existence of Titans was questionable, which again illustrates just how monumental the fall of Shiganshina was, and how the Titans were very much pushed into the walls as collective conscience. But something that I find interesting here is Yuri's Titan. The only things that are formed, and are formed very specifically, are his face and his arm. My interpretation is that perhaps this is a super high degree of control. The connective tissue from his arm seems like almost the bare minimum to hold up Kenny, which to me says that this is like a ultra-optimized transformation. The rest of his limbs and stuff are not even beginning to transform whatsoever. Maybe overanalyzing? Definitely overanalyzing, but makes sense considering he's the royal founder. But Yuri then notes that he can't control Kenny, saying he must be an Ackerman, and then adding that his motives for seeking him out must be personal. In the present day story, we know that he worked for Rod because he wanted to get the Founding Titan, so a personal interest as well. But way back when, he just did it as retribution for the Ackerman clan. And if you really want to, and of course I do, with this I think you can go like really really off the rails. Yuri is the Founding Titan, so the flow of time is completely irrelevant, meaning that Yuri is also Eren. In Eren's day, there are two incredibly important Ackermans for whom Yuri sparing Kenny and stopping the persecutions sure seems important now, doesn't it? I'm not saying this is because of Eren, but I might be saying that this is because of Eren. But okay, returning to normalcy, Kenny then talks about how, against Yuri, he was completely powerless. As we already know, fundamentally, Kenny respects strength and sheer power. So with this being the first ever time that his brute force nature failed him, well, he sort of broke right open and realized that this pursuit of quote-unquote justice for the Ackerman clan was just a lie that he told to himself. The thing that he really craved was this kind of ultimate power. I think some of that more than likely does stem from their persecutions, but I think for the most part, this is just his view of freedom. It is peace that is achieved through this overwhelming strength that simply makes conflict impossible. And I think that is demonstrated beautifully by Yuri just bowing, then apologizing, and saying that he can't die just yet. Like Kenny himself says, seeing a omnipotent king, more akin to a god, bowing down to him just broke something in his brain. Kenny's way of dealing with problems is just to slice and dice. That is his form of power. But here he sees someone so incredibly powerful that he doesn't even need to fight. I'll let Sadler explain the rest. <laughs> Soon, you will become unable to resist this intoxicating power. 
Though what's interesting is that this trend of an Ackerman being a little rattled by someone strong is actually present within all three of our powerhouses. With Levi, that is kind of true twofold. He was taught the power of violence by Kenny, and he was also not penalized but rather recruited by Erwin. Mikasa was saved and then pushed to fight for herself by Eren. And Kenny, well, he kinda goes head to head with a literal god. But what I'm getting at is that through the Ackermans, we explore these different avenues of what strength really is. They themselves are physically just monstrously strong. But with Erwin, we have strength through order. With Eren, we have strength in his unrelenting pursuit of freedom. And with Yuri, there is strength through peace and mutual respect. All of which I think will play into that always a slave to something angle which we'll get to in a second. He then goes to visit, I don't know how to say her name so we'll just say his sister, who, you know, isn't doing exactly great. Also, I've mentioned this before, but the whole Kenny the Ripper angle is an obvious spin on Jack the Ripper who typically went after women who worked in prostitution. AOT just puts a spin on that and Kuchel, Kuchel, again I don't know how to say her name, is actually his sister. But it's here where, after a whole season's worth of teasing, we finally get to see the meeting between Kenny and Levi. And oh boy. This is one of those super subtle scenes that just cuts so so deep. The whole, what's your name, just Levi, and just Kenny, already establishes that they are truly alone within the walls. Which may or may not also be why Aaron ultimately chooses that for his quote-unquote host story. It's a convenient explanation that works for just about every Ackerman. They all had targets on their backs, so it only made sense that they would get attached to a single or, at most, a small group of trustworthy people. But when it comes to Levi, I mean, do I even need to say anything? The cabin sequence was obviously extremely traumatic for Aaron and Mikasa, but this, it's just sad. Going from the 100% confidence, no regrets, monstrously strong, legendary captain, to this frail little boy whose hair is bigger than his head is just oof. We are still expecting the spin-off manga about Levi, so I'm sure we'll revisit this point in his life at some point, but this is one of those great times where you leverage all the present day story and these subtle character moments to make what is a tiny flashback hit super hard. Like again, obviously, it is sad because this is just a kid who is clearly miserable, but what amplifies that like tenfold is the Levi we know in the present day story. As for Kenny though, he says that he wasn't going to let Levi die, but that he wasn't fit to be a parent either. Personally, I think he was being a bit too hard on himself. For their life in the underground, I think he did pretty alright. I mean, look at this frame right here. It's cursed and it's perfect. Also, the color slowly returning to Levi's face is a nice little touch. But easily the most interesting stuff in all of this is the whole conversation about Kenny's faith in Yuri. Again, there is the angle of Yuri just being strong, yada yada. But I absolutely think that raising Levi also played a role in him generally becoming a bit softer. By normal people's standards, it's obviously still the ruthless Kenny we know. But I think seeing Levi grow up and escaping the shadow cast by the death of his mom was Kenny's sort of my job is done moments. He taught Levi how to survive in the best way he knew how. And I think it's that part of him that just craved peace. Judging by his conversation with his grandpa, I think he had very mixed feelings about seeing Levi just grow up to be the same monster that he was. And so, he distanced himself, not because he didn't care, but the opposites. Because he did, and very deeply. Again, if you go back to the Crystal Catacombs and the whole not leaving a scar thing, I think that is another point of evidence. And I think all of this is captured beautifully as we cut to Kenny and Yuri sitting by a lake, in what is the most dreamy and picturesque scene imaginable. In a classic case of overanalyzing, ducks in a number of different cultures usually represent good luck, peace and prosperity, which I think very much tracks here. Kenny first notes that it's somewhat strange seeing a monster undone by something as simple as age and disease. Which number one is just a super depressing line about humans in general because our walking meat bags aren't exactly reliable. But more importantly, number two plays into that untimely demise as a result of the curse of Amir. And with that in mind, Yuri then talks about the whole Titan inheritance angle. Personally, I don't think that at this point, Kenny actually had any desire for the Titan. I think it only started after he saw Frida basically become Yuri. But before we get to that, Yuri then drops the foreshadowing of the century. It won't be long before this world begins to crumble. From humanity's twilight, I hope to construct a paradise. I think there are two ways of looking at this. Number one is that this is Carl Fritz speaking and that this whole building a paradise thing is just a vow of peace. But number two, the world will begin to crumble, as in the rumbling? And what is the rumbling episode called? Dawn of Humanity. 
So after it is all said and done, from the twilight, Aaron too hoped to construct a new world, right? A paradise with no walls, no titans, and most importantly, no one attacking them. And I think that is only further strengthened by Yuri saying, you're a believer in the power of violence, is the unavoidable truth of the world. This is definitely a bit of overanalyzing, but if this were to be Aaron and Kenny, their color schemes also evoke a little bit of irony. Kenny, dressed in black from head to toe, is the one craving peace, while Yuri slash Aaron, donning all white, is the one speaking of the world crumbling. And to overanalyze even further, Yuri talking about how they became friends after being so close to destroying one another, I think also has some very interesting parallels to Aaron and Reiner, only entirely reversed. Or actually, in the long, long run, not actually reversed. Hey Vsauce, Michael here. They were very close to destroying one another, but eventually, he trusts Reiner, or at least chooses not to kill him, right? Also, Botanist Kuroto is back because yet again we have those now very familiar purple slash bluish flowers. Everything we've talked about with episodes 1, 10, and 37 once again applies here. The purple is reminiscent of royalty, aka power and status. The flowers themselves, probably lilies or the campanula medium, could represent gratitude, faith, and love. But perhaps most of all, I think they represent the Founder's influence. Blue and purple in general appear a whole lot in connection to the Founding Titan, and with the Founding Titan literally sitting right here, I think that tracks. And more broadly speaking, I think this is just one of the most somber scenes of the entire series. I think that dreamy color palette and hazy post-processing juxtaposed by this almost fatalistic conversation about their brittle bodies and really humanity as a whole beautifully encapsulates a lot of the themes we often talk about. It really captures that paradoxical feeling of ignorant bliss while also being 100% aware of the bleakness of the world. I think it's a very neat way to sort of briefly put us in the headspace of the Founding Titan. It is this omnipotent figure talking about the world crumbling but just looking out at the calm lake. Returning to Kenny though, after seeing Frida inherit Yuri's Titan, he just became absolutely infatuated with it. It was no longer a hypothetical. He saw Yuri's words, Yuri's personality, just Yuri in Frida. And so, he began to ask the question of, could I ever see the world like that? What did you see from that lofty vantage point? And if you wish to overanalyze a whole bunch more, Historia rejected the Founding Titan, and so, once we saw her fly in the clouds, it was her escaping her father's shadow. But Kenny is absolutely enchanted by that prospect. He is not Historia with all of her friends and allies. Kenny is just Kenny. He has no attachments to anything, and so he wants to see that idealistic world. And to achieve that, well, he kinda created a cult, and we all know where that ends. Jumping on over to the mid-card, it just formally ties together all the Ackermans, but basically doesn't really give us anything new. What's cool though, is that the illustration is like oozing blood, because, you know, all of them are kinda very prone to drawing blood. Returning to the episode and also the present day, Kenny sits under the tree, the setting sun coloring the skies in yet another picturesque radiance. It's a fading twilight, Kenny's death and Historia not eating Aaron facilitates the rumbling. And it won't be long until the world crumbles. I also think you could take the similarities of the trees and the crystal pillars to mean that Kenny dies alongside his allies. Or in other words, he died with his dream. But I think the imagery of sitting under a tree just evokes this sense of dreaming, of being one with nature, of reconnecting to your roots, and all of those kinds of introspective themes. And also note that Kenny no longer has his super shady trench coat or bloodied hat. Now, he is just a single wounded man. And the music here is also just gorgeous. Though we finally catch up to where the previous episode left off, with Kenny revealing the injection. Naturally, the question that pops up is, why didn't he use it? Well, I think the answer is actually very simple. I think he now knows that he can never become the Founding Titan and he could never see the world like Yuri did. This is sort of his moment of enlightenment. Yuri spoke of bringing about this paradise, but Kenny now knows that he could never be a part of it. That dream was shattered. There is no paradise to achieve. What would him turning into a pure Titan serve? Nothing. And so, he just giggles and drops what is easily one of the best lines of season 3. Every single person has one thing in common. Alcohol, women, faith, family, kings, dreams, children, power. Everyone spends their entire life drunk on something. Everyone was a slave to something. Even him. Much like how the rest of season 3 demystifies the Titans and reframes the story as always having been a human conflict, I think this is Kenny realizing the truth of the world. 
there are no kings, no gods, no true power. All there is are people deluding themselves into believing something greater. Which again lows back to Historia's decision of becoming queen, Aaron's enslavement to the Founding Titan, and all of those themes of free will we've talked about before. I think the line of a slave to something is basically just a twist on the question of what's the meaning of life. And unless we like find a door at the center of the universe with a sign saying level 2, the uncomfortable truth is that there is no point. And to cope with that incomprehensible fact that fundamentally absolutely nothing truly matters, people try to look for something or even construct something to latch onto. Something we see explored through these almost tribalistic conflicts in the series. Fundamentally, like any other organism, the only built-in function a human has is to survive and procreate. That is it. Absolutely everything else is just a fantasy. Unsurprisingly, this is a bit of a touchy subject for many as it is sort of a very nihilistic point of view on the world. But in my mind, these perceived values is a lot of what Attack on Titan is about. The Founding Titan, being this omnipotent figure, is merely a conduit that allows us to explore the fundamentals of it all, while also allowing us to explore the personal conflicts from that existential uncertainty. Take Amir, in terms of raw power and ability, I mean, yeah, she is like a magical god. But to someone else, she is the devil of all things. And to someone else, well, she is just a slave. Aaron as the Founding Titan is a transcendent figure quite literally existing outside of time. But he is also Armin's best friend who just cries because his life and free will was ripped away from him. Emir, the Titan powers, the time loop, and everything else in the story, in my opinion at least, isn't there just because it's cool, but because it allows us to explore both sides of the conflict within a single person. Dune is actually another series that I've recently begun dipping my toes into that also deals with a whole bunch of these similar themes. Big recommend if you're curious, but I'm definitely not a lore master there. And while we're still talking about this slave to something and free will angle, here's a little fun fact what I've recently learned. And fair warning, I'm a goofy man on the internet and my diploma is in finance, not physics. But apparently, in particle physics, there is a deterministic equation for standard model particles. Or, in other words, if you know their states at one point in time, you will know what they look like in, oh, I don't know, 2000 years because it is deterministic. The only thing that can change any of that are random quantum jumps. So what you have is a deterministic equation and a random event that is, by definition, random and not controllable. So, um, either photons have free will or people don't. I'll let you make your own conclusions from that, but I recommend checking out the video by Sabina and the Free Will Theorem paper if you're curious. Absolutely fascinating stuff to think about, especially because it really changes nothing in the way you do anything, so it's kind of just fun to think about, you know, it's the best kind of stuff. But yes, this whole a slave to something angle is of course one we'll explore time and time again. As Kenny is bleeding out, he finally reveals that he is actually Levi's uncle. And Botanist Croto makes a return because we have these white daisies in the forefront. I think those are daisies. I think the simpler interpretation here is that they represent innocence and purity, which I think tracks considering these are Kenny's dying words. That said, they also look somewhat similar to the Emir flower representing the Nine Titans. And we also see it in Ilsa's notebook, so it could also be linked to the Founding Titan. Flowers aside though, the animation of all of these scenes are just gorgeous. Like seriously, every single frame here is like a painting. Also, continuing on the juxtaposition of seeing Levi as this frail little boy, we have another very rare moment of him actually showing raw emotion. We see the whole world just black out, with only Kenny walking away, as he asks, why did you leave me? Only for Kenny to respond that he wasn't cut out to be a parent. I do think there's an argument to be made that he regrets not being by Levi's side, and that this is why he has the realization of always having been drunk on this fantasy of getting the Founding Titan. But I guess that is still up to your interpretation. Kenny was still a very ruthless and very bad dude, so who knows. One of the final things we see in this episode is Historia being crowned, with the people all chanting her name. The dedicate your heart salute here is a very nice little touch. And the music is also, once again, very very cool. But what is easily my favorite thing here is Historia going to punch Levi. Obviously, it is very funny goofy how she goes through this whole I'ma beat him up only for him to literally not even flinch. But in classic AOT fashion, it also casually slips in one of the most profound character moments that I think most people wouldn't even really notice. Because Levi smiles and just says, I am like 99% certain that outside of the No Regrets OVAs, this is the one and only time where Levi actually full-on smiles. 
this little lad, who I can actually call little because he's like one of the only characters in fiction shorter than me, is hurting, and his loyal squad cheered him up. Super wholesome. This is what I meant with the friends title, by the way. I think this is it. As for why this whole Historia beating up leave I think even exists, once again we must go on to the ancient scrolls, because in the manga there's a whole bunch of stuff that was cut for the anime where Levi did go a little bit overboard with how he treated Historia. He didn't quite pull a Aaron Tribunal, but it's definitely a bit strong. Okay, but really, this is like so so wholesome. Oh yeah, and the final thing in this episode is absolutely nothing noteworthy whatsoever. We just see an absolutely demolished Reiner, which I'm sure is no big deal, it's not like he absolutely annihilated Eren, but Bertold quickly yoinks him out of the Titan. Oh yeah, and I guess then the Beast Titan just casually says, I won, we'll rescue Annie later, the coordinate is our top priority. I mean, yeah, I joke about it, but this is really one of those scenes that I often just completely erase from my mind, because I remember seeing it for the first time, and it was just so incredibly abrupt and so detached from everything else that I was just like, Oh. I don't know what that means. Keep in mind that the last time we saw Zeke was like Udgard, so season 2 episode 4 and 5. And we haven't seen Burrito and Reiner since the season 2 finale. And on top of that, don't forget that we could have had all of our theories, but we don't actually know that the Burrito duo is in any way associated with the Beast. Let alone the fact that they are also cooking up plans to join Kani. I think this little scene here is just an extremely efficient way to show us that the world is not stationary. Things are happening even if we don't see them, something that is very important to keep in mind with our good buddy Ymir who may or may not already have been eaten. As for Reiner's squad, retroactively it just works to explain their absence and why they didn't pursue Annie. But most of all, it also sets up the legendary arc that has returned to Shiganshina, which will apparently have all three of them, and again, like no big deal, the beast destroyed the armored who destroyed Eren. I'm sure that is no big deal. And on that note, this is where we'll pick up next time. A slightly longer one, but our first double episode in quite some time. Now we'll be diving into my absolute favorite part of the story, so definitely solo episodes from here on out. But alright, I've rambled on for long enough, so next time we'll be going back in time once more to learn a bit more about our good buddy Grisha. So I hope to see you back as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. And while I still have you, just a quick update. At the start of the year, I said I hoped to get back to the usual 14 day on the dot schedule, but I'm still dealing with a bunch of ups and downs with my health, so for the time being, I think the 16-ish day schedule will be the norm. With how deep we are into this project already, I definitely don't want to start rushing things down. Me also starting 15 other massive projects certainly doesn't help matters, but it is what it is. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.